Hello everybody, Mike Levin, Friday, September 23rd at about 9.15 a.m. I'm walking to work and so much I could talk about this morning. Uh, oftentimes I choose between um, work, uh, personal, or say, you know, speculation about the future, futurism, uh, programming, uh, all kinds of, uh, oh, of course, you know, being a great science daddy to Addy. And um, the Maker Fair, we're going to be at the Maker Fair tomorrow. So things such as robots and lock picking are on my mind. Uh, I have a visual here I've been dying to use in a more GoPro style video, but it is a... Um, see-through lock and you can actually see the pins in there and it is a great lock to uh, practice lock picking on but I will need both hands to produce uh, that particular video so gee I should probably do something other than 29th Street you saw 29th Street yesterday and uh, they're all frankly uh, quite boring down here I'm avoiding the uh, touristy walks and instead uh, using these uh, lower crossroads near say um i guess the fashion institute is uh, up ahead of me um, that walk would really be 27th street going a block too far but uh maybe just to mix up the scenery of the videos so uh let's see what else um oh my work my work and uh pipuli. uh each time I do an iteration of this system, well, first of all, the particulars of the system itself are always in fluctuation. When I first started doing, you know, my own homespun uh, frameworks, they were generally to handle relational database front-end user interfaces, a lot like Ruby on Rails. Some call these systems CRUD systems because they generally let you uh, create and uh, pull up records and update and delete them and uh, knit them together into, you know, nested hierarchical uh, form editing relationships. You know, you, it's like web forms within web forms. And in that way, you can support pretty much any uh, data relationship you need to, uh, such as... Uh, bill of materials, uh, placing a web order, there's a whole host of these things that uh, the basic CRUD user interface on uh, relational database tables can accomplish. It's like making versions of Excel on the web, but then there was Excel on the web, or at least Google Spreadsheets. And all this need for all this stuff became dramatically diminished. You just spun up another spreadsheet. Uh, instead of uh, creating a new web app. And then of course, for people who still wanted to make it like a web app, there was Ruby on Rails. So uh, that kind of framework was no longer worth focusing on, even though I had one that I got so much mileage out of in my sort of in-house operations. It was running you know, almost all the business functions of Scala when I left it. And uh, that's Scala Digital Signage or Scala Multimedia, not the popular scalar programming language. And it was running huge parts of Connor's communications. Um, it's sort of extraction of that system became Hittail, which is still going strong today. And uh, yeah, that was on uh, VB script under active server page, really dead end platform there. So um, instead of redoing a system like that, I switched to what I really needed to do, which was ad hoc investigations. It's a weird thing, but making batch script files easier. Uh, you have a concept of uh, some lookup or, ex or data extraction or, you know, finding you need to, a question you need to answer. And answering that question involves going to various data sources. Um, in my field, it's often the 
uh, Webmaster Tools API, which is now Search Console. I'm trying to get in the habit of calling it GSC to go along with Google Analytics, which is GA. So I'll be prefacing things with either uh, GSC or GA. So uh, those are two common APIs to need to hit for search engine optimization work. Another one is just doing crawls of sites in different capacities, crawling a site uh, in, I guess, the screaming frog sense, which is coming back with a list of URLs and data points about those URLs. But there's also checking individual known pages to grab bits of data off of it, to look for changes. Um, and uh, then there's uh, looking at the search engine results, which used to be a top 10 sort of game. So you could just uh, save down a copy of a search directly on Google and maybe even set the results per page to 100 to minimize your number of HTTP calls. And uh, that was enough. Uh, you could uh, plot the positions of everybody on that keyword. But now with mobile results becoming different from desktop and with uh, the search result pages themselves becoming so entirely customized, uh, just like any other media, it's the front page of the newspaper, uh, the first page of Google results uh, on whatever you search. It's going to be monetized. There's going to be a split based on how monetizable those searches are between advertising type content and editorial content, i.e. the search results or uh, SERPs, search engine result positions that people in my field, you know, uh, uh, labor over to get them better on our keywords for our clients. And so another data source we hit is essentially screen scraping of search results, which has a whole bunch of issues there because uh, it gets customized based on where the search is performed from. So they're always customized for geolocation and not a lot of getting around that unless you were to bounce off of other servers located around the world, either as the thing performing the Google search in the first place or just as a proxy or kind of a traffic repeater. So your traffic looks like it's originating from where those uh, remote computers are. There's all different approaches to that, but probably my new system should support that, making my traffic for my API calls or screen scraping tasks be able to uh, originate from anywhere uh, around the world and be able to mix it up, even just to get around uh, quota limitations on how many uh, Google searches you can do from any given IP be before it uh, throttles the traffic or throws up a CAPTCHA that you have to fill out. So fortunately, if you don't want all that proxy bouncing stuff and it throws up a CAPTCHA, my new system, as opposed to being really remote server based like my last version of Pipulate, the new version of Pipulate, which lives in SEO notebook or, or it lives in Jupyter notebook. I've been thinking about renaming the whole project to SEO notebook because uh, I've used Pipulate already on the server based project. It's got some followers on GitHub and I don't want to lose those stars by uh, throwing it private uh, or anything like that. So I'm looking at exactly how to uh, position what I built in Jupyter notebook as Pipuli. It'll uh, come in time, but basically when I start making videos for how to use the new Pipuli under Jupyter Notebook, I will reach out to the GitHub uh, subscribers to the old Pipuli repo and tell them, hey, go over to this new thing. Here's some videos uh, about what's happened and why. And it's actually uh, kind of... Uh, but kind of uh, important to my future goals because what I've built in Jupyter Notebook is much more worthy of users and followers. I have, as I frequently tell my coworkers now, looked at how to take uh, data investigations and processes and make them able to be you know, easily sent to them. Um, typically this sort of stuff is what you would do with Microsoft Office attachments, uh, 
Excel documents with built-in macros that you're expected to run when you receive them. But we all know what a bad idea uh, that sort of thing is these days. So instead, I am going to advocate installing Anaconda and, uh, you know, for, for, their, for their operating system with uh, Python 3 version, 3.x. Uh, and I will uh, send to them my IPython notebooks and a directory of the support files that go with it, probably as a zip. There's still sort of a packaging step to make it one file and an attachment, but when you unzip it, uh, there will be an instruction. Uh, I suppose I'll put an instructions, a readme.html in there that they'd be expected to double click and that would pop up a page in their web browser. And um, that would tell them how to, uh, I guess, do the pip install. That's a good question. Uh, installing the virtual environment. Oh boy, there is some education. There's some, um, some things to show people to get this to work even once it's packageable and sendable as attachments because there are uh, Anaconda virtual environments, Conda environments that you'd have to have them set up and then restore the uh, requirements, which is more than just a, uh, a pip install um, of a frozen uh, pip state because it's more than pip that's installed. Plenty of stuff is installed by Conda. Um, and so I'm going to have to look at how that gets as close to automated as it can be. So there's going to be some caveats. These things are not quite as sendable around and immediate to play as, well, I was going to say Excel macros, but Excel macros aren't that easy either. There's all kinds of restrictions on, on that being allowed to occur to prevent the spread of viruses. So this is uh, quite different. This is creating a almost like a pseudo server environment on your local machine where all your resources are encapsulated up and made portable thanks to Anaconda and Continuum.io's work. So, um, I want to get to that goal, uh, that finish line as soon as possible so I can start making awesome videos about using this system and I created a workflow called SEO init that I can fill with all the things that you want to do when you want to start to do a simple audit of a website and you just give it your uh, your website domain and uh, potentially your GA uh, profile ID and uh, when you run it it'll ask for your authentication uh, it uses OAuth and so it'll pop you over to a, uh, a Google approval screen you approve it it gives you a code, you copy and paste that code back into Jupyter Notebook. It puts up a little fill-in uh, form for you to paste it into. And that's actually a very clever way to collect any credentials uh, you need locally that you don't want as part of the GitHub repo. Um, you add whatever file that creates as part of uh, the, uh, the GitHub uh, the git ignore, the dot git ignore file, and then suddenly you've got a place that can start to be treated like a, a library. I'll probably use a Python shelve object um, and just make all these uh, key value stores in this persistent object that can be written to whenever it needs it and doesn't find it in that always loaded object. Um, so it writes into that, then it's forever available, and it's in the local um, repo folder, so you never have path issues, but it's also in git ignore, so it never uh, pesters you uh, to add it to the repo under git. And uh, let's see what else, because it's pickled, you don't have to worry about uh, visually knowing its file format, it's just uh, uh, generic uh, dictionary objects uh, that follow the rules you have to follow to uh, use the shelve API uh, so that you can make your uh, your objects persistent on hard drive between sessions. Okay, so that's a part I need to build. I need to build the part that does the um, search engine uh, result page uh, processing and uh, 
Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. This is like inching really in on being something spectacular. Uh, I would probably like to make myself able to capture thumbnail images of what the search result pages look like because those result pages are so customized now, uh, like any other media uh, already is. It's a little taking people aback because they're used to this top 10, you know, blue uh, links world. That's what Google search results are, uh, but not so much anymore. It's uh, going the direction of uh, the portals of yesteryear that Google itself completely displaced. So it's interesting seeing Google going more in that direction now. It's not portals as such, but it's ad hoc portals that are created as a result to your query. And that's just a small piece of what's changing. Okay, so hope you enjoyed the uh, tour of New York. Uh, I'm almost at my building. I said I had a lot to talk about, and I guess I did talk about a lot. Emphasis on the work I'm going to be going to sit down and do. I'll choose which aspect of the system that's not yet built out that I want to build out, and then build it out as tiny as I can so that it's the least amount of code to maintain, the most highly readable, and, you know, essentially, what am I doing? A joyful investigation environment. I'll try and stay away from framework. Framework is uh, beaten to death. I'm making just a, a Python um, module that makes, you know, that's, I'm making a Python module for Jupyter Notebook that makes conducting S, uh, investigations, mostly for SEO, but almost anything having to do with online data, a pleasure. Thanks for joining me. Hope to see you again soon. And don't forget to subscribe.